book club session. Uh, this is chapter six. We're going to talk about how backers are individuals, not numbers. Um, fun fact that we can all learn today. People are people and not numbers. Uh, so yeah, we're talking about crowdfunder strategy, strategy guide, chapter six. I said in the email, if you're on the email, um, that was chapter five. It's not. We did chapter five two weeks ago. We're doing chapter six today. So let's jump right into the topics we're covering today. Um, so I start out this chapter with a story about something that I did when I ran the Viticulture campaign back in 2012. And that is, uh, I spent a lot of time during the campaign sending personalized thank you messages to every single backer who joined the campaign. Um, and I am really glad I did that. Uh, it, it made sure that I made a, a personal connection between every single person. I was seeing everyone as people instead of seen numbers because Kickstarter can almost, it's almost too easy for crowdfunding or Kickstarter to be all about the number. You see that funding number grow. You see that backer number grow. Sometimes you see it go down too. That can be really disheartening. Hey, Chris, thanks for joining me today. Um, and so to, to to have that personal connection, those personal per, personal messages really helped me see uh, the backers as ind individual people who were joining the campaign because they shared my passion for viticulture back in 2012. Um, the update, so a big part of what I'm doing about this book club is talking about how it relates to what I'm doing now, what a creator might do now if you're trying to crowdfunding campaign for the first time. And I found quickly when I ran my second campaign even, just a, you know less than a year later for Euphoria, that uh, there were so many incoming backers and so many public questions being asked, which is great, I love publicly asked questions, that there was no way that I could reasonably send personalized messages to thousands of people. I was able to do it to just under a thousand people for Viticulture uh, for a like a 40 day campaign. But um, Euphoria was a, was a shorter campaign that had a lot more people. And so my thinking here is that if you run a crowdfunding campaign and you were ever wondering, uh, if you ever have a moment where you're like, oh, I have nothing to do right now. I feel like I should be doing something and I don't know what to do. I think the answer there is to send personalized thank you notes. Uh, to your backers, look up the whoever the the last backer was, and send them a message to say, and make it personalized. Don't make it a cut and paste thing. Send them a personal short message saying, "Hey, thanks for your pledge." Um, you can ask them a question if you want, or you can just you can just thank them. And um, one thing that I did is I, Kickstarter allowed me to look at a little bit of the information about the backer, like where they were from. And so I might say, "Oh, I I took a trip to wherever if there if that's where the person was from um, a few years ago." Try to make that personal connection um, and just make it personal. Hey, Jamie, George, thanks for joining me today for this chat. I appreciate that. So, yeah, so this chapter is all about making that personal connection between backers instead of uh, viewing backers as numbers. And an example of this, because I know it's kind of hard to, to think about what I'm talking about when I'm talking about how uh, about the number. Um, it, it, here's an example of it that I think we can all relate to with social media, especially in this day and age. Have you ever made a social media post and you found yourself being a little fixated on how many people were or were not liking that post. I think that's something that we can all probably relate to at some point. I think I do it too much. Hopefully you don't do it as much as I do. But uh, but yeah, whenever I post like a YouTube video, sometimes I look at that video, I'm like, oh, I you know I thought this was a really awesome video. Uh, no, one's, no one's really interacting with this video. Same with a blog post, things like that. We look at these numbers all the time, but I think it's such a good reminder, especially for a crowdfunding campaign um, to, to look more at the people that are joining you and appreciate those people as human beings, as individual human beings who are saying, I believe in this thing that you are making rather than look at that number. And so I think sometimes it means maybe a modern update to this topic is to start to break that habit of looking at those numbers now. Break that habit now before you run a crowdfunding campaign. Look less at that like number or care less about that like number. Um, I, I see a lot of social people on social media celebrating when they reach certain thresholds, and I think it does feel good um, to to reach you know uh, uh, five thousand subscribers. You know that that feel that's a big number. That feels good to reach that five thousand subscriber. But uh, if you do that, you're also focusing on that number instead of the people behind that number, and I think that's what's important. Uh, so instead of like celebrating the the number five thousand, celebrate the the person who became the five thousand five thousand backer reach out to that person find out who they are and maybe talk about them celebrate them elevate them um 
practice, do things that, that help you practice looking at people as people instead of as numbers. I think that can go a long way when you're trying to run a relationship driven Kickstarter campaign. George says, uh, George has a question a little bit outside this topic, but I'm happy to talk about it. George says, if you would ever run a, a campaign now, would you go to Kickstarter or GameFound? Um, ah, that's a topic that I've covered a little bit on the blog, George. I jump around a little bit. Uh, I'm definitely more intrigued by GameFound. And, and and just to make it clear, like we're so our game is not going to run crowdfunding campaigns. We have, you know, web stores that that uh, that we want to direct people towards the, our web stores, not to a separate platform. Um, but GameFound, I think, is a little bit more intriguing to me. Uh, Backerkit's program also looks interesting. I like to experiment with things, um, but I also still appreciate the Kickstarter makes projects easy to find when through the friends who backed um, aspect of, of Kickstarter. And everyone who follows me as a creator on Kickstarter, they would get a notification if I launched a product there. So that's tough to ignore as well. But I think I'm most intrigued by GameFound at this point. Chad says, I, uh, oh, sorry. Let's see, uh, a, a, a fellow uh, social media creator, La Giochia Familia, they said, thank you for the follow on Instagram. That's great. So that's the personal connection right there. They saw that I followed them. They, they popped up here to say hi. That's awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah, they, uh, they were in my, um, my live stream yesterday and I ended up following them. Michael says, for me, while I appreciate the likes of my post, I appreciate better the comments. Yes, Michael, I love that. I appreciate the comments because I feel the connection. Yeah, the comments are where those relationships form, where those connections form. Um, the, 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 the comments, and again, not the number of comments, but the content of the comments, who's participating. I think that has so much more value. Chad says, I would definitely follow closely how many people were liking and following my Instagram. Um, that was when I was far more focused on number growth. As a freelance graphic designer, it was hard not to worry about how many eyes are on my work. And I get that. Yeah, it's, it, I would say it's almost impossible not to entirely focus on that. And you almost you need to be aware of it, or I need. To, I feel like I need to be aware of it because if I'm consistently posting things that no one is engaging with, whether they're likes or comments, that's a sign to me that I am not adding value to people. I'm not focusing my content on what you want, what you what you're looking for. Um, but uh, but I think making numerical growth. Uh, putting too much importance on it and making that like the thing that you're pursuing, your motivation uh, can can lead to disappointment and also can let down the individuals who are behind those numbers. Chris says, uh, comments are also a lot more informative to me as a creator than simple statistics are. Totally. Um, I'll come back to, uh, Michael has a comment here. I'll come back to your comment in a second, Michael. Let me jump around to the next topic, which is the, the $1 pledge. So this is something that I have kind of changed my opinion on a little bit over time. Uh, I think I will jump around a little bit here. Um, the $1 pledge. So I, in this chapter, I don't know where it is in the chapter, but I talked about the $1 pledge and how people can back at $1. I, I advocated the idea of backing a project at $1 or a, leaving open a $1 pledge level um, so that people could, could uh, back your campaign at that level. And I think in this chapter is where I talk about uh, where is that? I talk about the idea of, um, oh yeah, get, getting your foot in the door. That's what I was talking about, um, the $1 pledge. Giving people a way to back the project just a little bit so that they can see how you engage with them and then learn uh, more about the project and hopefully up their pledge to a full full backing later. And I still like the idea of the $1 pledge, but this was, I wrote the book before Kickstarter had a default like $10 pledge level. So that has changed things a little bit. Um, at the same time, pledge managers have also changed this. And actually, I think almost made the $1 pledge more important because there are more people now, I think, that want to know more about the project. They want to follow it for a while. They want to see that information. And they might not even be ready during the campaign itself to fully back it. They might want to wait till later when they see like the shipping prices, things like that. So I would say, especially with um, how much shipping prices can change these days, uh, freight shipping in particular, I think having that $1 pledge level is really important. The downside to it, the small downside, a potentially big downside, is that if you have too many people backing at the $1 pledge level and not the actual pledge level, you may not fund in the first place. So I think you still need to give people a compelling value-driven value, uh, value -driven, uh, reward level for them to back the project for real to get the pledge, um, to get the reward, rather than just back it and then later at the $1 level and then later come in at the... the uh, the full pledge and the pledge manager. I think that's pretty important. What else is going on here? Um, so Michael, I'll come over to your comment in a second. Yeah, and then I'll come back to uh, 
come back to the topic of the money back guarantee. So Michael says, I watched your video on Arc Nova and you seem to be fairly happy with it, but after watching a few more videos, people seem to have various issues with it from the cost of the game to the low quality parts. And I should say, Michael, um, I w I'm very happy with Arc Nova. Arc Nova has rapidly climbed into my top 10 game list. I really, really love Arc Nova. And honestly, I, I see what you're saying here. I haven't thought a second about the, the quality of the components because I love the quality of the game so much. Um, you say, yeah, you're saying a lot of things. I'm not going to read the whole thing because it's kind of mean here. Um, uh, I'll, I'll say this, Michael, but I, I, I can't, I, I'll read your comment. I, I don't agree with this, um, but I will read it. Um, Michael says, actually, this is way off topic, Michael. Um, so, yeah, this is about the topic of hype, which is a topic that I don't love. I think the key, Michael, is uh, I love Arc Nova. And uh, I, I, if someone else feels differently about the game or they don't feel like they're getting enough value out of that game, I completely understand that experience. But my experience with Arc Nova is that I love the game. I've gotten a ton of replayability out of it. And um, I, 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 think it's, I think it's worth every, every penny for me. So I, I really, really love the game. I, I think the dangerous thing here in, in kind of the way that you're talking about this is, um, is that people have different opinions. Uh, people, people like different games and... Uh, so a game that someone might spend hundred dollars on and really love uh, might fail for someone else, and that hundred dollars might seem like a total waste of money. Um, for Arc Nova, I, I feel like it's worth every penny, and that's just my opinion. Yeah. George says, "Which campaign was the most stressful for you, and why? How does the money back guarantee? Oh, sorry, Facebook just jumped way up. Uh, how does the money back guarantee influence the production cost of the project or the budget in general?" Thank you, George, for the the lead into the money back guarantee, which is the next section of this chapter, the money back guarantee. So I talk a lot in the book and in general about trust, gaining your backers trust and keeping that trust because one little slip up is equal to 10 like trust gaining uh, measures that you can take. So if you have one little slip up that can lose someone's trust for a long, long time, opposed to, to build how all the different things that you need to build up that trust. And so one of the things with the crowdfunding campaigns in particular is that people are gambling a little bit with their money. They are giving you their money for something that they are not entirely sure will be any good or that they will get it in a reasonable time frame. It's, it's a pretty big gamble. Uh, and that's the case even when we buy any game, but especially for a crowdfunding campaign where no one has the final version of the game yet. No one's seen it. Uh, they've seen maybe a nice prototype, but not the actual final version. Um, so for Viticulture, and I think for most, if not all of my crowdfunding, crowdfunding campaigns, I offered a money back guarantee. I said, if, if, you, uh, if you get the game and, and you, uh, you don't like it, I, let me see how I phrased it. Okay, so I said, if you pledge to support Viticulture on Kickstarter and you decide that the game isn't for you within one month of receiving it, you may return it to us for a full refund. Um, and I did this figuring that most people would not do that. They would not go through the trouble of backing this game and then, uh, and then sending it back to us. But it was also very much, so it was more a trust gaining measure to show people, hey, I stand behind this product so much that if you don't like it, if I fail on my promises to you, you can uh, you can send it you can send it back. You can get your money back. Um, and we did have that happen a few times over the years. For viticulture, this first viticulture, I don't think we had a single person request that. But over the over the years, I think I maybe over all my projects, uh, tens of thousands of backers, I had maybe a dozen people ask for that. Um, and uh, so I, I think I think. I think it's still worth it. I don't see it very much anymore, but I, I, I think it's worth offering that to backers. And one part of the money back guarantee that I also offered is during the production process, if someone messaged me and said, hey, um, I'm no longer interested in this. I don't, I don't like what you're building here. Or more often, I heard people just say, hey, I, I need the money that I spent on this campaign. And you know, I lost my job. They, whatever the situation is, they didn't have to justify it. But if someone asked for their money back, I give them their money back. With the one kind of catch being that if someone asked for their money back and then later, and I returned it, and later changed their mind, that's too late. Like, I've already gone through the trouble of returning their money. They are no longer a backer, and they can then get the game at, at full price elsewhere. So, um, yeah, I see the money back guarantee as, as still a viable approach, even though I don't see many creators doing that anymore. All right, let me go back down and look at questions. A few more the other topics that I'll cover today are... Uh, Trust, uh, stress, and the money back guarantee. Okay, so that's kind of what I'm talking about here. Um, and 
I'll talk about social media stretch goals a little bit, but I've already talked about that in another video about uh, social media stretch goals, how I don't think they're, they make all that much sense, but they can be a fun little thing if you're looking for something to move the needle forward a little bit. Um, and I talk about involving backers in the creative process. Let's come back to that in a second, because that's a big topic. Um, let's scroll down here and see what Michael says. Okay, Michael says, I'm mystified on how Facebook is sharing posts in the news feeds of my friends. A month ago, I posted the same content in two different ways. One is by sharing a link and I put my own thoughts about it. And one is by posting it as it is, as its own post. The shared one just got a couple likes, but the standalone post got a hundred, a couple of hundred likes. That is interesting, Michael, how the, uh, the algorithm or the formula for Facebook is sharing certain things and not others. I would have guessed the former would have been, um, would have been pushed more by Facebook, the one where you're actually adding your own thoughts to the post instead of just posting the, the link and having that pop up. That's interesting. Thanks for sharing that. Uh, Chet says, I'd like that your take on the numbers following is more about self-care. It's so important that we are taking care of our mind space to keep a positive attitude when interacting with backers. Good stuff. Yeah, and this is, yeah, I'm so glad you said that, uh, Chad. And this is actually something I don't know if I mentioned in this chapter, but about people who cancel their pledges. It is normal for people to cancel their pledges during a Kickstarter campaign while it's still live. In fact, I think it's a very, very important part of the platform that someone can back the the uh, back, uh, support the pledge, uh, pledge and, and support a project and then decide, Hey, it's not for me. And usually the reason has absolutely nothing to do with the creator or the campaign itself. It's just, you know, they backed it on a whim and now they still have time to back out of it and they, they choose to do it. They get excited about something else or uh, something happens in their, in their life where they decide this isn't how I want to spend my, my money. And I really, uh, and one thing that Kickstarter does, I don't know if they still do, do this, but they, back in the day, they would send you a message. They would send the creator a message saying, X person has canceled their pledge. And I think that is so um, unhealthy for a creator's mental health. I don't think Kickstarter should do that. Uh, I think they should put that somewhere else that you have to go looking for it if you really want to see it. But even, so what I did is that I would, I. Uh, set up a filter in Gmail so that I would not see those messages because they were so, um, even a, a, after a, a great day on a campaign, if someone, if I would get that notification saying so-and-so canceled their pledge, it would be so disheartening. That would really sit with me. And so, and it wasn't doing me any good. I wasn't learning anything from that. Some backers like reach out or some creators reach out to those backers and say, Hey, like, what did I do? What's wrong? Like, why would you, why would you cancel? And I don't think that's healthy either. I don't, I don't, I don't think that's a, a, a healthy thing to do. Um, for emotional health. And so I, I set up those filters and, but importantly, going back to what we're talking about today, looking at those numbers, if you are watching the numbers constantly, you will see them go up and down. And so it, it'll, every time that it, it feels good for going up a little bit, it'll feel really bad when you see it go down, even though you've done nothing wrong, you have no control over that. People are going to leave the project at times. So that's why I really advocate not focusing on the number too much. And I think I mentioned on an earlier live stream that every now and then I look at my YouTube subscribers, which I should not do. I really should not do it. I try not to look at the dashboard, but every now and then I do. And and I sometimes I see it go down. I see that subscriber count come goes, go down, even though that's perfectly normal for someone to say, I don't want to subscribe anymore. But it doesn't feel good for me to see that. So I really try not to look at that. or And also try not to watch the number go up. The number is not important. What's important is the conversations, the connections, and the value that hopefully that I'm bringing to people when they watch the YouTube channel, not the number itself. Even if there are only 10 people watching the YouTube channel ever, uh, that should, that feels good to me, that, that 10 people would choose to say yes and watch the content. There are 18 of you right now watching live. That's awesome. Uh, thank you so much for being here. Like that, that's I love that there are 18 people who wanna be part of this conversation um, about crowdfunding and Kickstarter and entrepreneurship. Um, I'll do a few more questions, then I'll come back to this topic of involving creators in the in the in the creative process or backers in the creative process. Chris says, in case anyone is wondering what one dollar pledge rewards about which one dollar pledge rewards to offer, I did a survey to ask in the uh, board game design labs favorites. Let's see what the results are. Thank you for sharing this, Chris. I'll pull this up right now. So, oh yeah, so there are different things that you can do at the $1 pledge level. You could just say $1 pledge, you get access to the pledge manager, but you can also do fun stuff with it. The thing that we used to do back in my younger days, and even then I wasn't that young, so I shouldn't have been doing this, but we would do a backer toast. 
And so at the end of the campaign, for everyone who added that dollar to their pledge or backed at a dollar, we would toast them. Like we being my business partner and I, Alan, we would sit in front of a computer, we would record a video and we would say the name of a backer and toast them and take a little sip of a drink. But that number grew quite a bit. It was in the hundreds, I think got close to 500 at one point. And that is a lot of sips of, of even beer, um, a lot of sips of beer. And so uh, we, I, I, we kind of took turns taking the sips. I sometimes would drink a little bit of water instead of a beer. Um, but it was a fun thing. Backers seemed to really enjoy it. Anyway, Chris's poll says uh, most people just want access to the pledge manager. So that, that was 45%. Some people want future benefits, like access to future beta tests. 14% of people said digital media, like a screensaver. 11% said something lighthearted, a toast in your name. There's the one that we did. And 8% was a public thank you. Even though a toast in your name is very low here, Chris, I would say, I would say that that was, it, it, it was again, great for that connection between me and backers. Um, because a lot of backers got to, to have, you know, I was actually saying their name in a camera and saying oftentimes a little specific thing that they added in their message. Uh, and so making that connection, make that relationship, I think went a long way. It wasn't just about, definitely it was not just about the dollar. I mean, like it was not worth the dollar at all. It was worth about worth that connection and hopefully that long-term personal connection. Um, Let's see. Michael says, "I feel like if you're going to have, if you're going, if you're going to have a way to back a game, there needs to be a high level of transparency." Absolutely, yeah. That goes into the into the level of trust. Being constantly, I was when I was a, a well, I'm still I'm a creator, but when I was a Kickstarter creator, trying to be always as transparent as possible. Often, um, being open to giving bad news and good news, just being transparent about all the things that are happening, especially during the production process. Uh, Chad says, well, that full refund really shows that you have a lot of trust. I wish more campaigns did that. and might weed out games that have not been properly developed before hitting print. It could certainly happen. Yeah, I mean, um, I think some campaigns do it where they allow, but before you actually deliver the product, they offer a refund, but they take out the cut that Kickstarter already took, which I get. But even that, like, you're only going to get a few people asking for this. And is it really worth it saying that to someone, no, you don't get all of your money back because Kickstarter already took a cut or GameFound already took a cut? Like, so what as a creator if you eat $3 off that pledge, off of, you know, five pledges over time? Now, if that builds up to a certain amount, then maybe you change your policy at a certain point um, if you're getting hundreds of people. But that's probably an indicator that you are doing something wrong and maybe... Uh, need to deal with that in other ways. I, that's a bigger problem, bigger sign of a problem. Um, I will say that the one, like this made a little bit of a mark on me because um, th mostly the instances that I got where, where people decided to use the money back guarantee were instances where they got the game and they played it and they realized it wasn't for them. And some of those people, probably the smarter of those people, sold the game because all of our games were discounted so much for Kickstarter that they could easily sell them and make a profit. Um, that's not really, I shouldn't judge there. It is a sign of intelligence, just a sign of whatever they wanted to do. They wanted to take me up on the offer. Um, but there was one person in particular who the day that they received the game, they requested a, uh, to, uh, the money back guarantee. So we'd already shipped them the game. They had received the game. They had it in shrink. They knew they hadn't done anything with it and they wanted to send it back. And of course we did it. We had like, they, they, I believe paid for the shipping to send it back and we refunded their pledge. But like that to me, was a total waste. Like why, why did, why didn't they tell me two days before that, before we even shipped it to them rather than wasting that, that shipping expense to get it to them in the first place. That was unfortunate. That was kind of sad to me when I saw that, like use it if you want to, but play the game. See if you want uh, open up the game, even it was still in shrink. And that really made a mark on me. As you can tell, I still remember it. Michael says, do you think it's hard to make both a game for yourself, but also listen to feedback to make a game for people and how that can be a conflict of interest? Michael, that's a great segue actually into the last topic I wanted to cover, which was involving backers in the creative process. Something I mentioned a lot in these, these crowd funny videos is that I strongly advocate, I strong, strongly believe in having a game, um, if you have a game on Kickstarter, to have it be almost complete, if possible, uh, almost everything, at least in terms of gameplay, complete when you launch the campaign. I see so many campaigns launching where they're like, yeah, I still have to finish designing the second 50% of it. I've seen established companies do that. Um, very famous companies say like, hey, you know, we have another we have another half of this to design. If you're a small time individual creator and you, you uh, 
and you're looking to raise money for art and graphic design, I get that. But the game design itself doesn't really cost all that much to do. That's something I, I believe should be completed as much as possible in advance when you launch that campaign. But leaving that little percent open to collaborate with backers because backers might have some really, really cool ideas. The key though, in my mind here, Michael, is, uh, and I say this like this, collaborate on your own terms. Leave some room open for backers to say whatever they want. Sure, backers are great. Like, you can't stop our backers from doing that. They are going to say whatever they want anyway. But uh, you probably have maybe a few small questions or doubts about the game itself. And by asking those questions, by asking specific questions and getting specific feedback, by you posing the question and asking backers for feedback about the things that you actually want feedback on, that uh, I think can lead to really healthy collaboration. That's focused. That's things that you want answers to that backers might be able to help out with through polls or comments. Um, and that way those conversations aren't spiraling out in other directions about things that you aren't willing to change at that point. By asking those questions, you can focus on the things and kind of moderate those conversations about what you're willing to change as part of the creative process. And by doing that, then you're actively involving backers in the creative process and they get to feel like they are part of the creation of this thing. Uh, Keith, actually, a fellow creator, uh, Keith is joining us. He says, all those Kickstarter cancellation emails got sorted out of view on my side as well. Yeah, I think that's I think that's the, the healthy thing to do, Keith. Um, totally agree there. George says, the first Viticulture Kickstarter had backers design, backer design cards in it, right? The artist got to draw them. Was that a special pledge? There weren't backer design cards. I was still designing the mechanisms for the cards, but there were cards with backer art, which um, you may have heard me talk about how I do not think that backer art is a good idea. If you have a really special volunteer backer who goes way out of their way, they're playtesting, they're moderating, you might reach out to that backer and say, hey, thanks for doing that. I'd love to include uh, you in this game itself. If you want to be immortalized in the game, I, I might be able to do that. Um, but having backers pay for custom art, I think can lead to a host of problems. Uh, it's, it's a lot to manage. Uh, you're going to have some backers that aren't happy with how they're depicted in the illustration. And most importantly, it, le it gives you no control over the diversity of the people that end up in the game. And so you might end up with, if I don't know, I'll just say it that way. It, leaves, it doesn't give you control over the diversity. And I think in having a diversity of people shown in your game, um, age, gender, ethnicity, um, is really important. Michael says, I agree, it's not good to see people unbacking. It's the same mentality of Twitch viewers and how that can affect you. If someone leaves, it would be more beneficial to receive feedback as to why they left so you can possibly correct the issue moving forward. And yeah, Michael, I've talked about that a little bit on my blog over the years. Like, is it a good idea to, um, to follow up with backers, to cancel backers with it, with a question and ask them like why they canceled. But because I think the answer is so, unless like you do a very specific thing and you see a lot of people leave, but then you probably know the answer. I did this thing, that's why people left. Um, I think the most, the, the, when, whenever I've done anything like that, the answer is always like, eh, I don't know. I, it, 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 like it's oftentimes nothing that you did at all. So there's very little to learn from it. Um, so I don't know. I, I have not seen much value gained in, in doing that. And I'd rather focus my limited time and energy on those who, uh, who decided to stay rather than those who left. So I think that's, that's the key. How are, you gonna, how are you going to prioritize your limited time and energy on the people who are leaving or the people who are staying? Um, and I think it's really important to remember those people who are actively staying and being involved in your project. Michael says, one of the things I love about your videos is that you always talk about other games, even the non-Stillmeyer games. Um, speaking on non-Stillmeyer things, who's your favorite non-Stillmeyer designer? Uh, I'll say right now, Keith, because Keith is in the in the comments here. I love Keith. He designed uh, Role Player and is a, a big part of the uh, the design of all and the development of all the, the Role Player universe games, even though he isn't the designer for all of them. Chris says, oh, surely I wasn't bash bashing the toast. Yeah, no, no, I wasn't thinking that was a bash. I did this survey more for my own edification about what to offer in my Kickstarter campaign this August. Uh, just thinking of you and Alan trying to drink 1,000 sips brings me a wry smile. You must have been a mess afterwards. Yeah, we never got up to 1,000, but uh, the videos would take would take a long time. And um, yeah, it would, it would, there, was, there, was one, there was one pretty rough night after that. Let's see. Um, 
just scrolling down, looking to see if there are any, any related questions or comments as we wrap, wrap up here. Ivan's joining us from Greece. Uh, yeah, I think I think that is the end of this topic, the end of this chapter. Um, yeah, let's read the final paragraph to see, to sum it up. As creators, we have the opportunity to look out into the crowd and see individual people, not a ubiquitous mass. That's why each of the people on the cover of this book is unique and colorful and not a blurry gray figure. Yeah, in fact, originally when the cover artist came up with this book, the, this word guide, so I don't know if you can see it right here, but those are people down there. And uh, originally it was kind of, it was just a gray mass of people. And I was like, look, like the whole thing behind this book is about relationships and about acknowledging the people who share their passion with me for, for, with, for my projects. Um, let's make them colorful. Let's make them unique and individual. Even though together they form a collective mass, and that's really important, they are individual people who are backing your project. In a few weeks, we'll talk about how to make friends and lose money. I think this is about uh, about budgeting, about um, about mistakes that I made that that uh, that can I mean, mistakes that anyone can make. Early birds, exclusives. That'll be fun to talk about. Marty says, his son Zach says, hi, and wants to share that he just won his first game inside, scoring 91 points. Congratulations, Zach, on a 91-point score. That's a great side score. Congratulations on, on that win. Um, Michael says they made a 2.0 cover printing. I, I think it's the same cover as the original, Michael. I'm talking about like when they were, go, before we started the printing of the book, they, they gave me several cover options. And I was like, no, not that one. Let's, let's change up that aspect of the cover. So it was before we went to print, not after we went to print. All right, I think that's that's it for today. I'll be back in a few weeks. Thank you for joining me. I'll pop this over on YouTube in case you have any follow-up questions or thoughts. And uh, yeah, have a great day. Take care, bye.